Hi, this is David Abanak Total. Welcome to video 7B, which is the second of four videos devoted to the topic of operational and integrated risk management for the 2012 FRM. This is a part two topic, of course. We continue in sequence according to the study guide and four brief chapters from the new textbook that's assigned in 2012 by Philip Carell, the Handbook of Risk Management, and then five readings that reappear from prior years that continue in the operational risk topic, enterprise risk management, a review of key issues in operational risk capital modeling, challenges and pitfalls in operational risk, implications of all operational risk modeling techniques, and the failure mechanics of dealer banks, which is, was reclassified from a current issues to an operational risk topic. And then uh, related learning spreadsheets as usual, 7B1 and 7B2. 7B1 illustrates the idea of setting um, the equity cushion based on a rating assignment and a target probability of default that's in the Stoll's NOCO paper. And then 7B2 illustrates some of the loss distribution approaches. That's the actuarial approach to operational risk that uh, probably predominates in terms of uh, operational risk approaches. So let's look at chapter six, liquidity, <clears throat> the ultimate operational risk. And so Carell says that liquidity risk is the risk arising from uncertain liquidity conditions and that is unique to each firm based on its operating environment. So liquidity risk is not a standalone risk, but emanates from how the firm allocates its assets, what the firm's funding strategy is, and what the firm's collateral policy is. And so the, in this brief chapter, there's just the notion that liquidity balances can occur if the value of the firm's assets or collateral change to, due to market conditions or if the firm's funding sources are disrupted due to external factors. And so Corell is saying that in order to manage liquidity risk, the firm needs to maintain a balance between the internal variables along with managing external variables. Now he makes a point that because most institutions are highly leveraged, and this really is by definition if we think about a bank, he makes a reference to the Cook ratio, so that's really the Basel regulatory ratio where even back to the original Basel Accord, that Cook ratio of a bank's capital to risk-weighted assets needs to be at least 8%. And so in general, even uh, banks will have Cook ratios in the single digits or, or low double digits. If we think about that, that um, the equity or capital to risk-weighted assets is still fairly low, a bank and most financial institutions by definition are leveraged and that means that any uh, uh, decrease in assets equivalent to the Cook ratio here immediately makes them technically insolvent. He says that bank fin financial institutions use a variety of asset liability management techniques, but that after the global financial crisis, these techniques have lost some of their relevance as firms are exposed to liquidity risk from external sources. And so then there's just a uh, bifurcation into internal sources of liquidity risk, which his typology is li liabilities, assets, and collateral. And then there are two internal sources of liquidity risk. One, valuation risks. The risk that the firm's assets are mispriced or the firm is unable to sell them due to adverse market conditions. And this sub, sub points here, market depth and nonlinearity of the valuation function. Due to the presence of liquidity risk, the valuation of assets tends to become nonlinear. And secondly, funding risk. So this refers to the risk arising from higher funding costs in alignment with the bank. 